All right, ladies and gentlemen, I have looked so forward to this because I've known this guy, even though I haven't spoken to him actually uh, authentically in 38 years, I've been a fan of this guy when I was a fan of wrestling and he was a wrestler. I, when I got in the business, he became my hero when he, uh, stood up for the business uh, on national television, and then the stories about him are endless. We are going to separate some of the fact from the fantasy here because our guest today has been a wrestler, a truck driver, a bounty hunter, and now he is he is a compound owner. Ladies and gentlemen, down there in West Tennessee, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. D, David Schultz. Yeah, it's great to be here, man. I'll tell you, I, uh, a lot of people thought I'd died off and withered away and all that. Oh, no. I'm still here, and they're still shaking in their boots, thinking I'm going to show up somewhere. <laughs> well, now but that's you, can, you can make them nervous uh, a whole new way because your book is out with our friend John Cosper. Oh. Of course, John's from here in Louisville, and, and he's uh, we've been involved in a couple projects together, and he's been on the show. But the newest book from John Cosper and Dr. D. David Schultz is Don't Call Me Fake. That's the that's title right. of it, you know, and that's your your motto. Well, you know, uh, you know, I'm anything but fake. You know, I'm an entertainer. I'm an exhibitionist. I'm a cartoon character. I'm a hillbilly. I'm a redneck. Whatever. I'm not fake. Definitely not fake. But anything but fake. Don't call me fake. And, uh, you know, John Cosper did a heck of a job on this book. Uh, we worked on it, uh, I'd say, almost a year and a half, two years. And uh uh, John's one nice guy. He he was really too nice of a guy to meet me and start dealing with me. But I got I, I think I got him straightened out on that. You know, <laughs> hey, everything ain't like you see it now. You need to pull off them rose colored glasses because you can't look through them and deal with me. <laughs> and he said, he said what? <laughs> I said never mind, John. You'll be all right. You know, but a heck of a guy, man. Nice family. Uh, you know. Nice guy, and I, I just feel bad sometimes because I, I rib him a lot, you know. And he's getting he's getting where he can take it a little bit more, you know. Uh, well, John, John, John led a sheltered life till he got involved with the wrestling crowd. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And then uh, <laughs> now he's kind of like going, "Oh my goodness, oh my goodness," you know. Just hit what, what? I said, John, calm down. Uh, don't get your bloomers all in a wad. It'll be okay. He said, "What?" I said, your panties or whatever you wear, John, don't get them in a wad. <laughs> oh, a couple said, times. Sound, couple that's times. not going to sound good on radio. <laughs> well, he, he's asked me a couple times. He said, do you think I can get sued for putting something like this in a book or whatever? I'm like, no, nah, John, it'll be all right. But, um, but he, oh, he, yeah. Took, yeah. he took us through your life. And one of the things that most fascinates me about your life and career that uh, maybe a lot of other people, they just pass it by is your original training. Cause you were trained. You're from West Tennessee. Originally you were trained by Herb Welch and the Welch yeah. and Fuller family influence on Tennessee wrestling from the thirties to, to the eighties. The, it, it, it was it, the West Tennessee guys were the last guys to be trained that way. I mean, Vern probably had some old school methods, but this was some pioneer shit that Herb Welch oh, yeah. did. Oh, and those yeah. guys did. And, and, and if you made it through that, you had an ex, uh, kind of an education, much like a lot of the guys had that were getting into business in the thirties and forties. You were training in a barn. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, yeah, it was a barn. Matter of fact, Herb Wells had a barn outside his house. Finally, we trained in a uh, old theater for a while, and then he built a barn and built the ring in there. But Herb was a uh, tough, tough old guy, man. He was sixty-seven years old when he trained me, and. Uh, it talks about it in the book. You know, I drive 45 miles and I'd work out for a couple of hours with Herb and, uh, I'd get home. My wife would have to help me out of the car. I'd have to blow the horn and she'd come out and pick my legs up one at a time and then let me lean on her to get in the house. I could not move. This guy stretched me and showed me stuff that, uh, you know, and what he was trying to do is discourage me, make me quit. Because back those days, that's the way it went. If you couldn't take it, you was out on your head. Yeah. Nobody got in because they were big and all steroids and walked out and this here, this here. Hey, if you couldn't take it, you were gone, you know. And uh, after three months of working out with different wrestlers, he'd bring in from Goulas and Welch, you know, out of Nashville. And uh, they told him, they said, listen, you got to do something to this kid. He don't, uh, you know, he, he he's going to hurt us. He's not going to mean to hurt us. We're going to get hurt trying to protect ourselves from him because he's so damn tough. 
So Herb come out and told me one day, said, after about three months, he said, David, you're never going to make a dime in the business the way you're doing. I said, what am I doing? He said, well, everything I show you, you're using on these guys, shoot moves, you know, how to break an arm, how to break a leg, how to uh, dislocate a shoulder, how to do whatever you want to do to somebody and make it look like an accident. And he said, you can't do that. You got to learn how to, he said, work wrestling. I said, well, you've never told me that. He said, absolutely, I haven't. But you remember everything I told you because you're going to need it. But from now on, we're going to start learning you how to make money and work wrestling, you know, the way you do in wrestling, you know, to be, you know. And I never forgot what he taught me. And he told me overseas, you'll, it'll come in. It's so important to you to be able to uh, hook these guys that come out there, the Japanese wrestlers over in India, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, everywhere, all where, everywhere we wrestle, Germany. These guys would try you because they've heard so much about you. And if you didn't know what you was doing, they'd eat you up the whole time you was there for five weeks, six weeks, whatever your tour was, you had nothing but pain. And everybody was trying to tie you up and everything. So you have to make an impression real quick. And that's what I did. Herb Welch and those guys from that generation and and when – the business wasn't as, as tightly controlled, especially as it is today, but even later on, but they, they weren't shooters in, in the traditional and for the younger fans listening to us. Cause we got a lot of, for some reason, young people like us too. I don't know why, uh, but it, they weren't college amateur collegiate wrestlers, shooters in that sense. They were hookers. They were guys. That was the title of Luthez's book hooker. That's they were right, more dangerous right. that they, they could, they knew shit that wasn't allowed in collegiate or Olympic wrestling that could tear your shit up and that you used when you were in an unfriendly environment. Somebody was trying to fuck with you. That's right. That's way Herb, he, he worked on the oil rig. Uh, when he was growing up, he worked on the oil rig and he would uh, go at night in the towns nearby and he would challenge anybody that showed up. He didn't care who it was. If you got in the ring and stayed three min- or minutes with him, you'd get $100 or whatever. And he w- he said he very seldom had a person stay 30 seconds with him. You know, he would hook them, and uh, they start screaming and dislocate their shoulder or something. They got too tough, and they has gone, you know. And well, Herb, that's we, what he we, did. We've talked about here on the program where guys like that, and, of course, he was out west because the Welches were originally from Oklahoma working on the oil rigs, but guys that would go to the carnivals, yeah. to the at shows. And, and, yep. you know, yep. take the local challengers, Roy Herb's brother was always the, the promoter in, but it, they kind of took that, uh, Southern Tootsmont, st- uh, you know, uh, status as the guys who took wrestling from the carnivals and assembled all the tough guys and made a, a legitimate territory out of Tennessee. And they had That's to be right. the badasses cause they had to rule the roost. That's right. And Herb Welch had a hand like a catcher's mitt. You know, I mean, it would just, I mean, it double my hand size. And when he hit you with that hand, open hand, he'd leave bruises on you. And uh, he was one tough old guy, man. Nice guy. That treated me great. Uh, and he always uh, told his wife, Reba, you know, this is going to be one of the greatest wrestlers ever come along right here. This guy right here. And, uh, you know, he I was his favorite. And I used to see new guys come up there and he'd, start them out of course we'd send them outside they'd be throwing up all the way out the door you know just <laughs> puke, puke, puke. that's all they do you know uh, these big fat sloppy guys come up there and think they're coming in there to just uh, uh pay some money and they're going to be a pro wrestler well it didn't work that way and uh you well, know i get her herb, herb liked you because he at least he let you go home at night too because you know danny davis went through over there a couple or three years after you did and and he was, they had him doing farm work and pulling stumps and, and they even yeah. had guys living there where they wouldn't let him get that away. Was that was with Buddy Fuller out of Tennessee. He was yeah. singing guys and, and you had to go out and work all day and then go to the rent at night. <laughs> and, you know, uh, Buddy Fuller was a uh, relative there of Herb Welch and Welch's and all that Fuller's and all them was together. But Buddy was, uh, he used his head, man. He had all these guys working all the time, cutting trees, building fences, and he'd buy a property and go out there, and uh, within six months, he'd have it all uh, fenced off, quartered, cleared, ready to go, and he'd sell it. <laughs> and, in, and he'd also have six or eight free job guys, too. 
But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, you, you know the, the Tennessee guys used you the the promoters Nick and Roy and it said they used you up on the cards fairly quick after you broke in because I re- like you said I remember you know you partnering with uh, Lawler right early and and being involved in angles and things pretty much your your rookie year because you you weren't as big as you would get to be later on but you were still a pretty big boy in those days and and you were, your shit was believable. But how yeah, long yeah. did it take you before you got comfortable coming into the locker rooms like that? And in big towns like Memphis with 10,000 people or whatever, how long did it take you to get comfortable that you kind of knew what you were doing finally working with all these guys? Well, you know, when I started off in a little town like Malden, Missouri, uh, you know, it, uh, you have to drive up there. I'd leave home with fifteen twenty dollars in my pocket. I'd go up there and work four or five matches a night. I'd go in as a single match and come back as a tag, then come back as a mass man, then come back to Battle Royal, and then come back to something else. Every time we went up every weekend, but Herb told me, he said, boy, you got to get used to the people. And the only way you're going to get used to them is go in these small venues, and you're not going to make any money. You're going to make $20, $25, or whatever. You ain't going to pay your expenses, but you're going to get the experience. And that's what I did. And once I started in Memphis, I just fell right in. It was no other people... The more people, the easier and the better it was on me. And, uh, you know, me being a bad guy was no problem. Uh, just my nature, you know. And uh, You know, that, that's something you just it. said. That's something you just said. It was easier in those days. The matches in front of 10,000 people were easier than the matches in front of 300. Because you'd done all the work to get those 10,000 in there. They were ready to see it. But if it was oh, only yeah. 300, oh, yeah. you, had to, you had to get, sometimes you had to get them individually. Yeah, exactly. I've been I've been to towns and there'd be uh, uh, sixty people, fifty people, and boy, those were hard towns. But you know, those people paid just as much money as those eleven thousand paid, and they come there to be entertained. And if you didn't entertain them, you was cheating them out of their money. And I always believed to give the people what they paid for, and I always left people uh, the way that uh, mad at me. They hated me. They wanted to see me get beat. They didn't care what, who beat me. They wanted to see me get beat somewhere. But they would, uh, you know, like New York, I'd be up there and the security guards and all, they'd want to come to the dressing room. I'd run them out, tell them they couldn't come in. And as I was leaving, you know, they said, yeah, that guy won't even talk to you. Wait, we'll catch him on the road one day, you know, up in Brooklyn somewhere. But you know what? Those guys would buy a ticket to see me get beat if they thought I was going to get beat. Just because I didn't sit around and talk with them and autograph their uh, kids' pictures and everything and make them a hero. I'm not, not saying I didn't autograph pictures to kids. I'm saying when I come in and say, hey, Doc, this is my kid. Give him my autograph. I say, get the hell out of the dressing room. You don't belong in here. <laughs> uh, you know, and now it makes you, uh, the kid looks bad on him, and they really get mad. But if they come up and say, Doc, is any way, man, my kid maybe could get an autograph or something? Sure. Tell him to come right around here, you know. But it's a different way. They come up and they think they own you, and they're going to direct you because they're a policeman or whoever, you know. And that doesn't work for me at all. Well, that the, you were a heel from the start, and and oh, yeah. they they used you. Uh, they I think you had Sam Bass as manager real early there in tennis before he got killed in you a couple times when you teaming with yeah. Lawler, and and you were yeah. figured in in a lot of the except everyone's. <laughs> I have a picture you might want me to pay to have me go away is when Lawler ever a couple of times put you in those, uh, the mask gimmick. And I think, weren't you the Riddler for like five days one time in a green mask? Yep. yep. I wore a Riddler uh, suit. I was the spoiler several times. I was Mr. Rathman a couple of times in Atlanta. Uh, you know, all they do is take a mask and put it on you. And you was that guy that night, you know, <laughs> I mean, I but mean, when, people when, just, when, when they booked you as you, though, you got over, you got heat. I don't know why. I, I, w- I wouldn't have done the mask thing to begin with because you, you pretty much established early on you were a surly kind of fella. Da- David Schultz was not to be messed with. And uh, oh, yeah. I always yeah, like, who, who, who yeah. were the bookers that used you the best in, those, in the territory days that got well, you over the best? The, the best one that got me over was uh, Stu Hart in Canada. He was a great promoter he uh, he told brett several times he said this guy this guy's gonna be the best he's gonna be the best thing ever come a professional wrestling he can take care of himself he knows what he's doing and he can talk 
And then Ron Fuller used me sparingly, you know. See, in, in the South, in Tennessee, around Lawler and all them, they didn't want you to get over too big. You started getting over too much, Lawler put a uh, hex on it. Nope, you can't use him no more. We got to beat him, you know, because Lawler always wanted to be the top dog. And he wouldn't let anybody get over him in Memphis or Nashville or anywhere he worked, you know. And it's see even the same thing today. I hear he's still out here trying to wrestle. I don't know how, but he is. <laughs> I just uh, I looked at him one day. I looked at him on a on a, a program they had or something. He was coming down to wrestle. I said, "My goodness, what uh, what uh, what you call them plastic surgeons? Did him and Bill Dundee use the same plastic surgeon? Oh, God, I could have did a better job than that on them. And, and you know these guys go out here and they. Uh, of course, now, you, you know, gotta, they're making money. Nice, they're making... nice to the king wrestling after he died and everything. Now, if, if a man oh, to be yeah. able to wrestle after he's been dead, that is, that is an accomplishment. Oh, well, that's what I thought. I thought he was dead. And then all of a sudden he showed up again. I said, well, that shows you can't kill him. He's just going to keep coming back. <laughs> and, you know, but, uh, you had all that to put up with and you, you weren't going to get a turn. They weren't going to turn you loose down here in Tennessee because they wanted to keep control of you and everybody else. And when I went to Calgary and stayed there three years, I, I drew more money than anybody ever drew there at that time. And then I went to Vancouver, Portland, Oregon, and then I went back down to Florida. And then I went to the AWA with Bern Gagne, which was a super nice guy, a heck of a promoter, and uh, always did everything he told me to do for me. And the day I quit, Vince McMahon told me to quit. He said, quit today. I walked in and told Vern, I quit. He said, nah, I'll tell you what, I'll throw you out of TV station. I said, hey, <laughs> you're, not a young, I said, you're not a young man no more, Vern. I don't know if you can do that. I'm glad he didn't try because he probably would have thrown me out and kicked my ass and sent me down the road. I mean, he was tough, you know. But, uh, you know, me, I was young. I didn't care. I'd try anybody. You know, I mean, if they had a reputation. Well, well, hey, that, that, as a matter of fact, in Stampede, and you spent so long there, and you did such good stuff there. As a matter of fact, Bret Hart wrote the foreword to the new book, Don't Call Me Fake, by David yes, Schultz and John yeah. Cosper. Um, and because the Hart family, they they liked that style. Not only was that, that Stampede style, was it was hard and it was stiff. And they liked the British influence guys like, you know, dynamite and those guys that like to hit hard, but they had a crew of a lot of the territories had a tough guy or two, but they had a crew oh. of tough guys at any one time you're in the, in the van with bad news, Allen and fucking Duke Myers and those, those big old guys that yeah, had to yeah. be interesting on the road when tempers flared. Well, I always drove. I drove every time, every day for three years up there. I drove my own car, and I would not ride in the van because that was – They didn't have a good track record. Yes, yes. <laughs> not at all of, of getting you there safely and in one piece in that van. Yeah, they would. They would. But, you know, the thing about, uh, the thing about that up there was uh, so funny. I'd always be there at 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock show. Sometimes they'd drive in in the van – uh, about 10, 30, 11 o'clock. <laughs> I mean, that one, that one once in a while, that, I mean, every week, a uh, day or two a week, it would happen, you know, cause the weather was so bad and they leave so late and all that, you know, and, but I mean, you know, the people would sit there and wait and the show would start about 10 30, supposed to be over at 10 30, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, that's the way it was. It's cold, 40 below zero in Saskatchewan. Uh, uh, you know, what are you going to do? Nothing to do. You're in an ice arena, you know, hockey arena, so it's cold anyway, but you ain't got nothing to do. Just sit there and wait for 1030. They'll be here. Hang on. They're on the way. They had car trouble or van trouble or something, you know, always something coming up, you know. Smith's but driving about the van. The van. If you rode in the van and you went to sleep, there's no telling what you'd wake up looking like. You'd either have your hair cut off or your beard would be shaved or your hair would be bleached or something, you know, the guys was always doing something to somebody, you know. And, and if, you, uh, if you didn't go to sleep on your own, that sometimes they would drop something in your drink to help you, wouldn't they? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You had to be careful. Don't leave a cup of coffee anywhere. Don't go out of the room and come back. If you don't know if you're going to get to the ring or not, you know, 
I told several stories in that in the book. Uh, don't call me fake about things that happened, the ribs and the jokes that was pulled on people. And uh, it's fantastic, you know. I, I get so much response about what happened up there, how it was done. What would you do this for? What would you do this for? Hey, payback's hell. Somebody do something to you, pay them back in a way. But they never knew I did it. Well, now they do after the book. But <laughs> I, don't, I don't get so good with care now. But, uh, you know. But the book is fantastic. It's full of uh, things that you never thought you'd hear about wrestling. And then uh, when you get into the bounty hunting, John just, uh, you know, he was at all about the bounty hunting. I had to really, uh, you know, you can tell so much. And there's thousands of cases that I went out and picked people up. And, you know, I had thousands of recoveries. I never missed anybody. And, uh, you know, uh, and I brought I, in bankruptcy. Murders, rapists, uh, I, I brought them all in. It made no difference. I, I brought them in. Kidnappers, uh, you know, it tells the stories about all of these guys, you know, the kidnapper had two girls kidnapped and FBI begged me to help them and I helped them and then they blew it, let him go missing. <laughs> so I had to go back and get him on my own. So that's what the FBI did for me, you know. I learned uh, not trust them. You know. Well, I, I love the whole part of the book about him. Also, there's some great pictures and stuff that, that people haven't seen before also. But I love the part of the book where he where he talked about you transitioning um, from wrestling. And it, it, let's let's talk about the Stossel thing real quick and then go into bounty hunting. But 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 you when you <laughs> transition, the the impetus for you transitioning away from wrestling was you had gone to the AWA. You were getting that. That was probably the, the big money spot, the main event spot that you'd had at that point in the business working with Hogan for Vern, right? Yes. yes. And, and it was so hot. And that's when, when he made the deal to go, of course, Hogan wanted his opponent, which was you and you were big enough that, you know, you could, you could make him a baby face, get some sympathy on him. Cause you're, you're big enough to handle Hulk Hogan. Then he, and he also, yeah. he took mean gene. Cause you know, the announcer there and, and pretty much he had handpicked the guys he wanted to take from the AWA. So it was running good there in the WWF and the, and the Stossel thing comes up right before WrestleMania when everybody's attention is on wrestling all of a sudden, cause all the publicity WrestleMania is getting and 2020 decides to do the piece your book gives the most detailed and first person account of the Stossel incident that, that yes. I've ever seen, but I had always thought down deep, just not even being there. I had said, you know what? When I saw it, I said that fucking smarmy faced announcer was sticking his microphone in front of all the boys face. He has pissed off probably every single person in that locker room. And somebody has suggested, Hey, why don't you go talk to that guy and tell him you think he's a fake. I didn't know it was Vince that did, actually did yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I had, had a feeling it might be Fuji. Cause he was standing around there, you know, not doing much, but looking, but I didn't know that it was Vince that said, how did he phrase it to you? Yeah, well, he told me, he came in the dressing room and said, David, we got a guy here making a joke out of the business. Uh, I want you to go out, blast him, tear his ass up, stay in character, Dr. D. And hang on just a minute. I get out here and get everything straightened out. And, I'm, and all the guys heard this. Everybody heard him, you know, give me those directions to go out and tear his ass up. So when I went out, uh, they called me out. I went down the hallway, and Fuji and uh, uh, the Iron Sheet was standing outside leaning against the door. If you ever watch the tape, you see him standing there at the door. Yeah. Well, I, I, I interviewed two to three different guys there, started talking to me, and John talked to me two or three different times. But what they showed is that one tape. Nobody ever seen the other tapes that where he started to interview and he quit. He said, Yeah, you're right. I can't handle this, you know. And uh, then he started another one. And then he finally got there and he said, Well, I think it's fake. I thought he told me, I think you're fake. But I guess when you listen to it, it's, he says, I think it's, I think uh, it's fake. Yeah. But anyway, that insinuation is the same. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I'm, I'm on national TV. I'm not on local TV. This is going all over the world. I've already been told that, you know, and, uh, so Vince was doing tapes for Saudi Arabia, Australia, Germany, everywhere, you know, and what you did that night, they see it. And uh, so when he said that, all I could think was just, you know, blast him. So I slapped him. I did not hit him in his ear. 
I did not hit him in either ear. And also, John Stossel, the doctors at the the arena there, Madison Square Gardens, the doctors now said they've seen no damage to uh, do him, nothing, his ears, everything's okay, good, and all this here. Later on, I found out that he went to a doctor in Boston. I think it was Boston. He went to a doctor, and, oh, guess what? The doctor was his brother. <laughs> and so he had, <laughs> yeah. When do you know who won the pony? Damage. Yeah, exactly. He said he had from near damage. So last year or year before last, John Stoss was doing a show on TV. My wife called me in there and said, David, you need to come hear this. So she wrote it back, and John said, Eurosomatic. He said, today we're doing a show on fakes, scam artists, uh, people who take money under false pretenses and all that. And, you know, I'm kind of guilty because my injuries was Eurosomatic. That means that once I got my money, I didn't hurt no more. Oh, my God. <laughs> he said that on this show, national TV, and the people said, oh, my God, that's the same thing. I mean, ah. You're kidding. But this guy lied on depositions. He perjured himself on depositions. Vince McMahon perjured himself on depositions. And nobody does anything about it. Because, you know, the first thing, you can't fight McMahon. McMahon's got too much money and my opinion of McMahon is that he's no better than a pile of dog poop out in the yard. And don't step on him, don't go around him, just leave him there. He'll dry up and blow away, and it'll be over, you know. But you can't fight him. He's got too much money, and he will make your life miserable just because he's got the money and he can do it. Speaking of Vince, did you think after the Stossel thing, did, he, did you think he was going to fire you or thank you? No, he thanked me. He didn't. Uh, he, he thanked me many times. Right, when did well, he stop thanking man. you? When the lawsuit came in, is when he stopped thanking yeah. you for it. Well, when when I when I got back from Japan after that, he sent me to Japan five weeks with Antonio Noki, and we did the same thing over there. I hit a reporter, but I made him fill it out, write a script out that it was a scripted hit. You know, right. I wanted to cover myself. Yeah. Right? <laughs> So five weeks, he run around with a bandage on his head. Hell, I wanted to give him money. I was so so, <laughs> hell, so fast. So, and then we got into the first deposition. The first thing they asked me, the lawyer, was one of the first things, Mr. Schultz, are you in the habit of beating up reporters? And I said, no, I'm not. He said, well, what about in Japan? You beat this reporter up. Just like, he, oh, my goodness, it hit me then. I done been had again, you know. But I said, hey, I have this in writing. It was a play. It was a part of the thing. You see, that's there, you know. But all that just goes on and on and on. And Vince is stuff, uh, to, you know, just anything you say about your bad, you know. But, um, you know, I got back. He asked me, said, David, I need you to sign this paper saying all this here, John Stossel thing was your idea. You went out and you hit him. <laughs> I didn't have nothing to do with it. I said, huh, I don't think so. I said, hey, I did exactly what you told me to do, and you thanked me for it, and you told me that's exactly what you wanted. I did a hell of a job, and everything's good. And I'll send you to Japan, and I'll send you to Egypt and different places. But after that, when I went and signed the paper for him, he said, you're not going to work for me no more. Well, okay, that's the way it's got to be then. So, you know, I walked out of the office, and that was it. I never uh, worked for him again. Because he wanted me to, and then after that, he put a lien on all my property. He tried to take my house from me in Connecticut, my house in Tennessee, my house in different areas of the United States. But he tried to put my wife out of my house and me and my daughter out of our house there in Connecticut, tried to take our house and put us on the street. And he had lawyers from everywhere trying to serve papers on us and get us out of that he wanted me to pay the $400,000 he gave John Stossel. Good. Well, I never was charged. Hey, I never was charged with John Stossel. I had no charges against me whatsoever. I was about I to say, that it, was only, it was only a civil complaint. There was never a criminal charge filed, was there? That's right. And it was against Vince, not me. And Vince paid $425,000. And he turned around and said, oh, we'll use this contract, make David pay us our money back. Well, what he's referring to is that bogus piece of paper he had everybody to sign. If you didn't sign it, you didn't work. 
And he told me the same thing. When I was in the office, you don't sign this paper, you don't work. So I signed the paper, and it was just a bunch of yeah, garbage. The, the, the contracts in those days had a clause that if you were if if a any the promoter suffered any type of legal issue or settlement or whatever as a result that he could then come after you to try to recoup that which uh, was uh, right. none of none of the you wrestling know. contracts in those days uh, would stand up to scrutiny no. but but they got away with them and he said uh, in his contract said i was responsible for my actions in and around the ring and anywhere at any time even at home, I was responsible for my. I mean, this guy had <laughs> nothing for me, nothing for me, 99% for him. But if you didn't sign it, you didn't work. And that's what they said. You had to sign the contract because this year will cover every insurance regulations he was using or something, you know. But anyway. Well, uh, hey, when, when, when he fired you, I've always wanted to ask you this because if, after you left there, you did go back, said, for, for Memphis for just a bit. And uh, you worked some independence and you had a wrestling school up in Connecticut for a while, but did you ever call Crockett promotions? Did you ever call Jimmy Crockett? No, no, because everybody I tried to go to work for after that would not talk to me because Vince had told them, Hey, if you use David on anything, I will not send you nobody. You won't use none of our guys and uh, we'll do everything we can uh, basically destroy you. I think that's almost that's why I, you should have called. I think you would have fit in with, with the Crockett guys at that point. And because the, the, it, the heat was starting to be so strong with, with both sides, you know, uh, against each other that, that, and you could have hung with those guys. I would have loved to have seen what you could have done there for that run. Well, with Crockett, some of the guys down there with Crockett, uh, I don't know who all they're talking about, but it's all, all that whole thing was set up to get rid of me, you know, John Stossel. That whole thing was set up to get rid of me. They couldn't get rid of me because I never missed a match. I was never late. I always did my job, and they wanted me out of there. Hogan didn't want me around. He was telling Vince, he was scared I'm going to beat him in the middle of the ring one day on live TV. And, uh, you know, he just got out of hand, you know, and Vince said, well, we got to get rid of him, you know. And uh, they – uh I don't know. They was talking about the rumors that Crockett had something to do with me getting rid of me or whatever. I don't, I don't know for fact that was true, but you know, I would, I would have loved to, I would have loved to tried to be your agent then and bring you together to sit down with Dusty. You would have made a fortune at, at, at from eighty five to eighty seven as eighty eight as a heel for Crockett. I think, I think you would have made money. Oh yeah, I think so too. But you know, I made money bounty hunting. Now, let me tell you, wrestling. Well, the, and that's what you did next. I did. I made more money bounty hunting than I did wrestling. Anytime. <laughs> well, and and you're, mean, that's that's the thing. You had a longer career as a bounty hunter. We haven't even really got to that yet. But and I know some yeah, people right. from Tennessee may think, "Oh, the bounty hunters, Jerry and David Novak." But no. Um, no, the real bounty hunter, the man that goes out and faces these people, the man that goes to New York City, Hell's Kitchen, down on the Grand Concourse at 2 o'clock in the morning by himself and drag these scumbags out of these buildings with 2,000 families in there, and you're the only white guy in the neighborhood. And I do it. And one guy was telling me, he said, you know, I got real scared uh, the other day or something, something he did. I said, scared? You got scared over that? You want to get scared? Go with me downtown, New York City, two o'clock in the morning. You want to get scared? I'll give you something that'll frighten you to death. You won't ever get back out on the street. And he said, "What?" I said, "Well, we had a news reporter come with us, and she was coming up the steps one night. The guy laying there in the corner on the steps, needle sticking in his arm, vomit running out of his mouth, or whatever." And the girl said, "Oh my God, is he dead?" I said, I don't know. Why don't you give him the mouth to mouth and see? I got to go get this guy up here. <laughs> and she started screaming and hollering. And I, I, I mean, she was, oh, call an ambulance. Don't bother the guy. Leave him alone. Come on. And I got up there and we got the guy going out the back fire escape in the building. And as we got down and got in the car, she said, what are we going to do about that? I ain't going to do nothing about it. You do whatever you want about it. You go, uh, whatever you want to do. I'm not involved. I don't know the guy. I don't know nothing. And she said, oh, my God, the guy was dying or whatever. I said, you need to go. Anyway, we left. I never heard nothing back from her, and I don't know if the guy died or whatever. <laughs> That's not my concern. 
a man sitting there with needles sticking in his arm, vomiting all over himself, or over DN or whatever, you know, that's an everyday occurrence in New York. If you, if you can't handle that, stay out, stay away. Two o'clock in the morning, hey, ain't nothing but badasses in New York, two o'clock in the morning on the street. Well, the, the way I mean, you got into this, the whole thing was originally was a guy that you knew contacted you because nobody else could get the guy they were looking for, and you and you brought him, yeah. and and from that point you had a hundred percent success rate. If there was, and for the way oh, this yeah. works is is basically these people have paid bail money to the court to be free awaiting their charges and they when they go through a bail bond agency obviously that that person puts up a large part of the money expecting to get it back when they show up when they don't show up then their money is on the line and that's when they call you to go find that person and persuade them to come back and you know go to court correct that's right basically what you said is correct but once they get the notice from the court, say a guy's on a, say a hundred thousand dollar bond, the bondsman, the guy has to put up, you know, ten percent, hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, put up ten thousand dollars. Plus, he's got to have co-signers, you know, people, their mother or something up for the house or whatever this year. So the guy leaves and he don't come to court the next time. The court orders him to be rearrested. He tells the bondsman, hey, you either bring this guy back. They usually give him six months. Different states, different areas, different, you know, different things. But six months, the uh, norm. And so the bondsman goes out with whoever he can get to go out with him. And they go to the people's houses and the address they have on the application for bond and threatens everybody, scares the hell out of everybody, tell them they're going to take the house, tell them they're going to uh, put them in jail, uh, everything they can tell them. Now the guy really runs. Really takes off. I mean, he ain't nowhere around no more local. So then they wait about four months, five months. They call me and they say, David, we got to have this guy. We got to pay him. You know, we just got a month to get him in. Uh, uh, will you get him for us? And, well, yeah, I get 10% plus expenses, all expenses. So I'd start working on them. Usually I found them pretty rapidly. And some of them, it took me a year or more to find. A lot of them, six months to find, eight months, you know, because they think they're free now because they've been on the lam so long. But, you know, if you've got a good lead on you go to the district attorney and tell them, hey, I'm close to this guy, but can I get a few more months? And they say, yeah. They don't want you to have to pay that bond, you know. They just want the guy back in court. So uh, I would keep going until I found him. I went to Cairo, Egypt, got a guy, and uh, I got a lot of them out of Jamaica and uh, Santa Domingo and Puerto Rico. I've done that just about every week. You know, I had good <laughs> contact. <laughs> you know, you, you, you <laughs> should have a frequent flyer card and a hotel card to go back and forth to Puerto well, Rico. I just about, I just about did. You know, down in Puerto Rico, you know, you can go to places down there that nobody speaks English. Nobody. Uh, and you're the only person there speaking English. And you're trying to talk to the police and you show them your badge, which is a bail enforcement agent badge, BEA. They think it's a federal rally. So <laughs> I, can't, I, can't, I can't convince them I'm not federal rally. I got a badge. So they cooperate with you and don't know what they're cooperating with you about, you know. And uh, But I had one captain down there out of one town that helped me. I'd give him $500 every time I'd go down there. I'd just go to the hotel and give him the address and give him the guy's picture. He'd go get him bring the hotel to me, you know. Because he said, if you go down there, you you might get shot, you know. And he's right, you know, certain areas. And uh, I had a very good, I had very good contacts all over the United States, California, Texas, Washington State, uh, Georgia. I had good contacts. I was good at what I did, and a lot of people, a lot of you know, I'd bring people in. They'd have a gun in their belt. And I talk them in and give them their gun and, and handcuff them right there and bring them out. And, you know, <laughs> well, mean, you, you mentioned in the book, uh, by the way, Don't Call Me Fake by David Schultz and John Cosper. But you mentioned in the book that a lot of people, they've just, they realize they fucked up. They're not going to give you a trouble, especially when they see you. They're not going to give you trouble. And you can kind of reason with them. But you've had some hairy ones, like you said. Who's the hardest just the whether it was the scariest or just the hardest or just the the most frustrating person to bring back that that well, you encountered. I had, I had one that was with the shower posse, which is a big 
posse out of Miami and San Domingo, Puerto Rico, and Jamaica and all that. They could all that. He was, he was one of the toughest ones I ever had. It took me about nine months to find him. He had a guy in Virginia working at the DMV that would send him a new driver's license every month with a different <laughs> name on it. A uh, good driver's license in the computer and everything. So anytime they stop him for anything, he just show him that driver's license and he's not wanted. So, and I had an informant down there. I went down several times and they told me he was in London and all that. So I went down and passed out some of my cards and told him I'm paying $5,000 for anybody to help me find him. So he was on a large bond. I mean, I forget what it was, 250000 300000 whatever. So I passed those cards out, and I got a call from a lady and told me, hey, you still want Andrew Headley? I said, yes, I do. She said, I will give him to you for $5,000 you said you'd pay. I said, okay. So I got, got on a plane, went down, met with her, and she said, I will call you uh, when we locate him this year. So two or three weeks, she called me, and she wants $500 advance, you know. So I sent her $500. I don't usually do that, but... You know, I could tell this woman's serious. You know, she needed the money, uh, rent review or something. Anyway, she called me up. She said he's in Gulfport, Mississippi, and told me the address. So I went down to Gulfport, Mississippi. Me and the sheriff hit the house, and Andrew was out eating breakfast, and he come back. Now, he told me this later, and the cop cars was out there, the lights or stuff. He took off. So we missed him about five minutes there, ten minutes. Oh. And then we, then we went to Birmingham, Alabama. She said, he's in Birmingham. Here's his telephone number. So I got the telephone number, traced it to a house, got a search warrant. Police went in there with me and nothing but a phone sitting on the floor. No furniture, no nothing. He had rented that house, had this phone, and he had all the calls forwarded to his cell phone, which at that time they couldn't track the forwarding calls to the cell phone. Oh. So when you call that number, he goes straight. I mean, this guy was smart, you know. So we missed him there. And then Atlanta, Georgia, he messed up. Atlanta, Georgia got a hotel in the days in. Him and his uncle, they were moving some pretty good drugs, I guess. And the girl called me and said he's in the days in near the airport. He always stays near the airport so he can get to the airport quick and get gone, you know. And uh, I went over and found the room his uncle was in. And the guy said, yep, they got two rooms. The other one's up here. So the police went to the room with me. And they knocked on the door. Andrew come to the door, and they said, uh, we're looking for Andrew Headley. He said, no, not me, Mark. Not me. He said, he gave them that Virginia driver's license, and they looked at it. They run it on the computer. They said, hey, this is not Andrew. This is John Blow or whatever the name was. And I said, no, oh, man, this is Andrew. And he said, well, we can't do nothing about it because, you know, he's got ID. Same thing him. I said, okay, are y'all finished? And they said, yes, uh, <laughs> Doc, what's the next? I said, okay. I grabbed him by the hair, pulled him out of the door, threw him on the floor, handcuffed him. He was screaming and hollering. The cops said, oh, my God, I hope you know what you're doing. <laughs> I said, I know exactly what I'm doing. I told him in the room, went in behind him, closed the door, told him, Andrew, I don't know how many drugs you got in these bags in here, but these guys, if you don't give me your real ID and tell them who you are, you know, they're coming in here. They're going to check these. And the reason I don't want them to check, they're going to lock you up here. And I'm not going to get to take you back to Connecticut. And it's going to cost me money for six months while you sit in jail and get extradited back. Plus, you're going to have these charges here. you probably go to jail for 10 years here. <laughs> you, and he said, oh, no, man. Oh, you got me. My ID's over here, Doc. Over here. Over here, Doc. Over here. I got his ID. Andrew Headley. I showed the cops. They said, okay. I said, come on, Andrew. I left your bags in the room. Closed the door. Got him a pair of pants, shirt, and called his uncle and told him, hey, you need to get up there and get Andrew's stuff, man. He's gone. And <laughs> hung up. No, I mean, I didn't, I, I can't say either that was drugs. That, either that or the, the maid at the day's end the next day suddenly retired and bought a brand new Cadillac Escalade. That's right, exactly, yeah. And then they would have been looking for me thinking I got it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, these were powerful guys. But Andrew, I, I, you know, we had a... We had a flight back to New York, got the car and drove to Connecticut. And he told me, I appreciate the way you treated me, man. I appreciate what you did for me. And uh, I said, okay, buddy, uh, my job done. You be careful. Have a good time. I don't know if he's still in jail or not. Probably is. But, uh, you know, people like that, you know, they they haven't done anything to me. It's my job to find them, not to hurt them, not to beat them up, not to uh, do anything, just to take them in, you know, to the court. 
And you know, out of all the guys I've ever took in, I had five people want to fight me. And those were big time Jamaican drug dealers. They had dreads <laughs> down to their ass, you know, and they thought they were bad boys. And they said, no, man, you're not taking me nowhere, Ma. I found you, man. I said, oh, yeah, baby. My baby needs a new pair of shoes. You're going to jail. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and, <laughs> and I, I got to gotta be honest with you. I'm not just blowing smoke up your ass. You are one of the more yeah. intimidating physical. When you got yeah. that game face on and you looked at people, whether it was in the locker room, hallway, or in the ring, or whatever, and, and you're physically oh, yeah. imposing, <laughs> I don't yeah. – and that's the, the whole Stossel thing, because say what you want. And there's a lot of people say, well, he shouldn't have been struck and he shouldn't have attacked him. But there's a way that I've seen many guys in the business be set down in a professional situation and said, well, now, come on. Is somebody telling you what to do here or whatever to get in the business? And then it's your job to make them believe no. But when he just yeah. starts, to, especially in your face, the way you were looking at him already, I said, well, I think you're fake or I think it's fake. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I just yeah. enjoyed the shit out of that. But wh- oh, where yeah. oh, where did you meet the crazier people, David, in wrestling or in bounty hunt? Uh, probably I'll tell you. Both of them got a bunch of crazy people. I miss them. I bet I miss. And you're gonna you're gonna say that's hard to believe. I met the the most trustworthy people in bounty hunt. I'm talking about the criminals. That I picked up, not the bondsmen for sure. <laughs> they're a bunch of scumbags, you know. They're gonna they're gonna beat you out of every dime they can or whatever. And I was a bondsman. Uh, my wife was a bondsman. We also, you know, I'd take people in and turn them in the front door and bond them out the back door. Bond, make money both ways, you know. But these people will, you know. I had a connection that the FBI would call me and beg me to help them find somebody that they've been looking for for three years. They couldn't find me. Uh, you know why? Nobody tell them anything. Talk to them or anything. I get on the street and I put the word out. Within a day, I've got a location on the guy property because I don't have to pay anybody right up front. I just tell them, hey, I'll give you five hundred dollars. Tell me what this guy locate this guy for me. Okay, Doc, I'll call you. Hey, Doc, he's over here on Preston Street, five twenty seven apartment A B one whatever. And you don't get there until three o'clock at night though. He does his drugs for you know. Okay, guy, I pick him up. I bring you money. Okay, and that's all I said. And I go get him next day. I go take that five hundred dollars. I don't run off and not pay him. And you know, on the street in New York, I use New York for uh, a lot. Of, I made a lot of money in New York. You know, New York City, and uh, picking up people. I'm talking about everybody. Uh, you know, if you lie to one person, you tell them one lie. It's worse than getting on the telephone or putting it on the front page of the New York Post. It will travel so fast, no one will speak to you. They don't want to talk to you. They have nothing to say to you because you ain't nothing but a liar. You can't be trusted, and that's it. And these guys are uh, drug dealers, murderers, rapists. But they're not liars. They're not liars. They're not going to lie to you. And if you, if you don't lie to them, you're okay. But if you lie to them, you might end up in the Hudson somewhere. You know, I mean, uh, and, it's and New York, they can we- lie you can you got a city of 10 million people. That's the ultimate example of being able to hide in plain sight. Cause the, uh, how do you begin? It's a right, and haystack. Exactly. That's right. Oh, and you know, God. they got some mighty big, Hey, I was up there one day and this is the truth too. I, I, you know, everything I tell you is the truth. I'm not lying, making up stuff, or anything else. And in the book, it's true. What's in that book is true. Honest to goodness. Fact. Everything is true. Well, hey, and, you know, I, I was up there one day. I was up there one day and I looked around the corner. I seen this little puppy come out and I said, come here, buddy. Come in. Hell, there wasn't no dog. He's a damn rat. <laughs> yeah, a rat. I've seen, come around the I've corner seen and look like a dog. You know? oh, a good garbage strike and they, they look like lemmings going over the But I, I saw one yeah. thing in the book that I've always wanted to ask you about because Dennis Condry yeah. told me this story when we were driving somewhere, riding in the car, we were together with Bobby. Yeah, about yeah. the time that y'all all went to Nova Scotia, because I get you and Ricky and Robert Gibson, the Gibson brothers, and uh, Dennis Condry and Phil Higgerson all got booked into Nova Scotia out of Tennessee well, that one summer. What was I think it was 77. That's right. And I'm the one got them booked there. That's right. I was about to say, I think he even put the blame on you for it. 
<laughs> he, he put the blame on you for for them being there, but he said they got stuck, and you allude to it in your book. They got stuck in the ring one night. That they had oh, yeah. fucked the Gibson yeah. brothers around, and people don't remember how good Ricky Gibson was. What a baby face, right? What a worker. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. oh my oh, yeah. god! And and but anyway, they had got some heat on the Gibson brothers, and. And the people were rioting and they were coming in the ring and the cops had pretty much turned on them, like had their hands on their guns, like at Phil and Dennis. And, and Dennis said, all of a sudden, here came David Schultz because it was a yeah. hockey building, that hockey stick, waving it over your head like a helicopter. And you were, you mentioned that in the book. That was, you he yeah. credited you for saving their lives. Oh, yeah. That was a, a bad situation, man, Phil and Dennis. And I had to get them out of there. Nobody else was getting them out. People were crowding in. I, that old hockey stick would make a sound, you know. <laughs> that was uh, that was uh, that was a good one. And uh, you know, a couple more times we had a couple more up there. That uh, old boy was about to throw a big old rock on my car. Dennis and Phil, we stick and get the car, and uh, and Phil said, "Come on, let's go, David. Let's get out of there." No, wait a minute, man. What are you gonna do with that rock? He said, "I ain't gonna do nothing with it, man." And he, he tried to throw it, but whenever he did, I hit him right across the shins on his leg with a hockey stick, and he went down. And his brother stepped up drinking a beer. He said, hey, don't you hit him again. That's my brother. I said, okay. I turned around and hit him right across the eyes. Broke his nose and both eyes. Blood shot out of both eyes. He hit the ground. We jumped the car and left. Never went back to that town again. Because I heard they were looking for me. <laughs> but, what? You know, I mean, you know, you guys and I had still practice have, from I, Tennessee. I, you had practice from yeah, Tennessee I, with dealing with stuff like that. Yeah, I still have that hockey stick, too, in my <laughs> car out there today. Same hockey stick. And, uh, boy, that thing will uh, make a difference, you know. If a dog, or we have bobcats down here, we have coyotes and all of that. If I, if I have to leave my gun or run out of bullets or something, then I grab the hockey stick. If you can get to them with that hockey stick, you can, you can hit them pretty hard. They ain't going to bother you no more. They may walk around the circle three or four hours, but, you know. But uh, I'm usually on. I'm, that counts I go on wild the, animals and wrestling fans, right? Either one. Will, uh, oh, you, yeah. Well, these people are, are crazies that come to the wrestling matches wanting to fight, wanting to start something, wanting somebody to, you know, want people to think they're bad. You know, I was sued over $100 million while I wrestled from fans. I'm talking about people climbing in the ring, wanting to kill me, jumping me outside the building, and they end up getting knocked out. Uh, I mean, you know, right there in Louisville, one guy jumped up the ringside, was going to come in. Uh, Howard, he's going to kill me. And he'd come through the rope. When he did, I hit him with a belt, scapped him. I he was fell there. On the floor. Yeah, I was okay. there that night. I was there that well, you night. Well, you've seen that bloody mess, man, didn't yes. you? It wasn't, it wasn't well, long after that. A guy hit the ring in Louisville on Lawler, and Lawler caught him yeah. coming through the ropes with a boot up under the chin, and everybody was like, oh, that Lawler, he he didn't need to hurt that guy. And they found out the guy had just got out on parole for murder, and the first the <laughs> infraction yeah. was he to revoke his parole was he hit the ring on Lawler in the Louisville yeah. Oh, yeah. That was a rough place, man. Let me tell you, if you was a good heel, you had people climbing in the ring on you. You had your tires cut. You had your cars burnt. You had stuff thrown at you. They would break your windows, anything they could do. I mean, now, a couple hours later, they probably regretted it, but, you know, they still they get so far this way. But, I'm sorry? I said, especially if you caught them, they regretted it even oh, quicker yeah. than that. Oh, but yeah. When when Phil Higgerson uh, retired, he had uh, he'd got hurt and he retired, and you started teaming up with Dennis Condry in Southeastern and for a while in Memphis. And I I want to mark out for a second because I thought you guys in the ring, I enjoyed you so much because you you were both kind of ahead of of the Tennessee heel curve. There, it was more like a Slater and Orton type of thing where y'all did some cool tag team stuff. You look good together. Oh, loved y'all's oh. promos. What, what was it fun teaming with Dennis? Oh yeah, yeah. Had a good time with Dennis, man. We we just, uh, you know, we thought we were going to be together forever, but there again, they seen us getting too much heat. We were getting over so good, they didn't want to put too much heat on us. See, what happened to these promoters? They don't want anybody too strong because if you quit or you leave the territory, there goes their uh, gates go straight down. You know, if yeah. you're supposed to show up and all of a sudden you're gone, uh, he wasn't going to show up here anyway. You know. 
Uh, that's the reason I always, uh, I never missed a match. I don't care if I had the flu, if I was down on my back, my leg broke, whatever, I would go, you know. And I even worked in Calgary. I uh, had a back uh, nerve cut my back from one of the matches. And it was just nicked enough that I couldn't walk hardly. But, you know, I had two days off, and then I taped myself up and made it to the ring. And I would stand in the corner and hold the ropes and beat the hell out of whoever I was working with. Yes, if, if it got within where you could reach I, I them. Got, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I made the matches because yeah. I was booked at those matches. If I hadn't made it, they would have oh, hell, he wasn't going to come anyway. You know, but they hey, never you know. knew I was hurt. I mean, because once I went through the rope, guy come at me, I'd start hammering him, you know, and i hold the ropes and take some codeine. You know, Canada is famous for codeine. Uh, you know, they give you codeine pills and you don't hurt at all. But I think it's why they're so nice. <laughs> it's, it's why they're all so friendly up there. But I, I remember you oh, did yeah. one thing. I'm going to, I'm going to mark out one more thing and then, and then we will, okay. you've been gracious with your time, but you did something that I'm surprised nobody has stolen yet in the business. Or if they have, maybe Brian can tell me, cause I don't keep up with all the new stuff, but that, Dagum leg lariat you used to do where you because your legs were so long anyway and they're big around and you would run take a couple steps halfway across the ring and jump up in the air and instead of clotheslining a guy you'd stick that big leg out and boom and whether you'd shot him off or you just took his head off or whatever it was a leg lariat nobody has ever done that that i've seen or at least to to that measure that looked that good yeah. And I so you can actually that. say that you had something that nobody has stolen yet. Yeah, nobody did because it's so, it's so rough on you doing it. You know, you're <laughs> up in the air. It's like it wasn't a drop kick. Or the drop kick, you straighten your legs out. You kind of land. You're okay. But when you go up with that leg, you're landing. You land on your right shoulder, your left shoulder, your head, whatever. And you knock the hell out of them when you do it, too. If they don't know you're going to do it or know how it's going to be done, most guys will put their hands up. Yeah. You know, kind of pad a little bit. But if they don't know to do that, then you just knock the hell out of them. You know, I mean, and, and you know, I, I, I was all, I always pride myself on being a guy that I go to the ring. People are not going to sit up here and say, oh, he missed him six inches with that punch. No, 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 not me. Uh-uh. I hit, I hit the guy. I guarantee you I hit him. And if he can't take it, he shouldn't be in the ring. And, you know, even today, man, old as I am, and I'm still in pretty good shape. I'm about two, I don't know, two thirty maybe. And not, uh, not because, uh, you know, anything wrong with me. I just didn't need to be 280 pounds no more. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, uh, plus I'm just trying to blend in, you know, get away from it. And, and I can't. Oh, that'd still. be easy for you to blend in, Dave. Oh, that'd yeah. be oh, easy. Yeah. Oh yeah. I thought, yeah. I walk out and they still found me. I had a full beard there for a while. It looked like, uh, ZZ Top or something, you know. I was down to my waist. People still knew me. And I said, why in the hell am I wearing this beard now? I'm going to have to wear sunglasses or a mask or something, just people. But, you know, they still remember me, and they, you know, they're amazed when I talk to them and tell them what I've been through. And, you know, it's hard to go through life and do as many things that I've done and still get up and walk around. I run a little bit, walk. I still work out a little bit. I get up every night around 12, 1 o'clock. I go to bed early, 5 or 6 o'clock. People say, <laughs> oh, my God, why do you do that? Well, I get up at 12. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> I got my free time, see, from 12 to 8 or whatever when my wife gets up, you know. And then it turns into the old honeydew. It ain't a honeydew list no more. It's a honeydew book with chapters <laughs> in it. Oh, yeah. I got to go through it every day, you know, and it's getting thicker and thicker. I'm going to have to hire an army to keep up with it, you know. Not really. She's a good lady. We've been married 48 years. Good Same Lord. woman. Yeah, exactly. That's what I said. And everybody and in, the wrestling, her, oh, in, 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 wrestling, in wrestling or bounty hunting, I think that that's probably still an accomplishment. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it was. You know, we went to junior high school together and we still together, and uh, we fight a little more now. I think she thinks I'm getting a little bit little, or she can beat me or something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's, she's been she's been training for the comeback all these years, David. She knew she'd lull oh, you into a false sense of security. Let me tell you, let me tell you when we worked out at Pascarello Gym up in uh, Orange, Connecticut, uh, 
she would go in there and she was working out every day and she would actually, I won't tell you the names of the people that she beat arm wrestling, but she beat a lot of the wrestlers arm wrestling. <laughs> they, got, they got where they wouldn't go around her, you know, and she was, I mean, she was built good. She wasn't a big woman, but she was strong, you know, and she would beat these guys and I'd take her in the ring and the guys, I was trying to show them how to do a suplex. They didn't, uh, you just couldn't get it through their thick head. So, I'd bring her up there and suplex her three or four times in the ring. And I'd get her home the next day. She said, don't you ever take me in that ring and suplex me again. <laughs> <laughs> but she's a good girl, good sport about it all, you know. And uh, But I'm, I'm going to tell you, this book, I have read. She's read it four times. My wife has read the book four times. She helped John to pick out little mistakes and stuff that it wasn't mistakes. It was just misspelling her names or whatever. Right. And she... Yeah, you know, and she read it four times, and every time she read it, she said, I cannot put this thing down, David, and I lived with you 48 years, and here I am reading a book about everything you've done, and I was with you on a lot of it. I was with you on all of it, but she actually went bounty hunting with me a lot of times, and she said, I just can't put it down. It's so exciting, and do you know how many people have told me that same story? I cannot put it down. He said, it's so interesting that, you know, I just got to get back to it to see what's happening, you know. I, d I don't uh, know whether we mentioned the name of the book, Don't Call Me Fake, by David Schultz and John Cosper. It's on Amazon, uh, I, I assume, right? Brian, help me out with the uh, the availabilities here. It is on Amazon. Again, the book, Don't Call Me Fake, is on Amazon. And, and actually, I think you can go to John Cosper's website directly, which is eatsleepwrestle.com, and possibly yes. get an autograph copy. Uh, there That's you right. go. That's right. That's right. Brian, you didn't go to sleep, did you? <laughs> he, he always lets me go because he knows I'm going to talk over him anyway. Well, but, uh, I that's right. Say, Tim, don't give you, hey, Jim, don't give you time to talk. I feel sorry for you. <laughs> Thank you, David. You see what I have to put up with each and every week oh, now, on the show? Now you're creating a monster. Now you're creating yeah, a hey, monster. Jim, let me ask you, Jim, Jim Cornett, let me ask you something. Did I, did I throw you out of the dressing room one time? No, you did not, because I never had the balls to try to go into it. <laughs> until the I until knew, the day they know. smartened me up, I, I never tried to go in. <laughs> Let me see, who was that guy that coming in and I throwed him out? I, I'm trying to remember who it was. He was one of the guys along with you at that time, you know, uh, Ah, oh, it's so long ago. I ain't seen him since I tried to throw him out. I guess he got scared and lost. It it may have but, been an uh, old compadre of mine named Kenny Bolin. Now I can believe that. That may have that may have happened. Um, <laughs> as a matter of fact, hey, we, I got, we, we, I we haven't spoken. Something. We haven't spoken in thirty eight years. Not because That's there right. was heat between us, but we've never been in the same place since you last left the Memphis territory. I was the photographer, and and you were teaming with the last run with Dennis Condry as as a team. Yeah, yeah, and since yeah. then, we I, we haven't spoken. So this has been a great and, catch up. And you know, another thing, when I was wrestling, if you was there, very seldom you got a chance to talk to me. Anyway, anybody would get very seldom get a chance to talk to me. Because Herb Welch always told me, don't go out there, sign these autographs, these little girls and kids and stuff. People see you doing that, they'll say, oh, he ain't that bad of a guy. Yeah, no, you he were said, never yeah. you were never sitting out there in the line at the, uh, at the concession That's line right. or sitting out watching the matches or whatever where people could talk to you. And of course, That's I could right. I could snag you for pictures because you knew it was going in the magazines. So that was that was oh, pure. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'd be there for that. Yeah. That was greed. That was greed, pure greed there. But uh, yeah. Uh, I tell you, they a lot of people. About, I was going to tell you about uh, after Bill after he was in. You know Bill, right? Oh yeah. Okay, he was in Atlanta, Georgia one night. Bill's a good guy. He he took a good photo of me and my wife and all that. He come into Atlanta, Georgia, one of the autograph sessions down there, and he come up and said, "Doctor Day, I ain't seen you in a while." I said, "You little asshole, I've been wanting to talk to you. What the hell are you been coming in about?" Right, 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 right. He took off. I didn't see him again, and I ain't seen him since. And somebody said he got scared to death when I hollered at him, and I thought he was smart, you know. But he took it literally that I was going to tear his head off his shoulders or something. I don't well, know. but David, here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. <laughs> I've always, I've always heard Terry Funk say this. I've, I've heard that Johnny Valentine maybe have said it first. It applies yeah. to you also. 
I yeah. can't make them believe that wrestling is real, but I can make them believe that I'm real. And I think you had the That's talent right. to make even people in the That's wrestling right. industry believe that they were in trouble. Hence the title of your book. Did we mention it? Don't call me fake. Because oh, there was yeah. nothing, oh. there was nothing fake about the presentation, and that's why it it got over. And you know what I liked in the later years was that when I threw the promoters out of the dressing room, or the people, <laughs> you know, the promoters, they say, "I'm the promoter here. I don't give a damn who you are. Get out of here. If you don't have a wrestling license, athletic license, you get out of the dressing room. Don't you come back down here, huh? TV station, TV owners of the TV station. I throw them out of the dressing room." And uh, I mean, you know, and people would come to the promoters come to and say, David, you got to lighten up this guy owns the See, I don't give a damn what he owns. Tell him to keep his ass out of the dressing room. This is a wrestler's dressing room, athletic. If he don't have a license, stay out. And then I turned to the promoter and said, if you got a license. <laughs> <laughs> but the promoters thought I was as bad as bad could be English. They were scared to death. They didn't know which way, you know. I mean, Ron Fuller handled it pretty good. He's a pretty big boy. Robert Fuller, uh, he was funny. He's like a clown to me. And uh, but Elton Owens and Don Owens and uh, Stu Hart was uh, the best one, man. He didn't care. He liked for you to tangle up. Yeah, yeah. You know, he didn't care. It but, broke uh, yeah, up he, the monotony in Calgary. That's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> hey, David, but, can I? You know, they just, can I jump in and ask I'm you sorry. something? You, you just brought up Ron Fuller. Yeah, I, I have to ask you because Ron recently talked about on his show, the Studcast. A night in Panama City where he was teaming with you and he got stabbed. Do you remember that night? I remember somebody cutting him or, or, or something. Yeah, yeah. I remember that. Ron was, uh, uh, you know, he was six foot nine. I mean, this guy was, uh, he'd hit you if you were working against him. He'd hit you and his bicep would hit the left ear and the fist would hit the right ear, wrap around your head. <laughs> the fuller, I mean, the fuller wrap around. around. The Fuller oh, family yeah. wraparound punch, yes. And, you know, he he never complained about anybody hurting him or anything or anything. It was just straight out, hey, if you want to go that way, we'll go that way. You want to go this way, we'll go this way. And uh, but now, Robert, Robert, I got him in the ring one night. He owed me $40. And he said he never paid me for two or three weeks. And then all of a sudden, I got him in the ring one night in a match. And I started beating the hell out of him. And he, he hollers the referee, oh, my God, tell the asshole, I'll pay him. I'll pay him. Put him <laughs> <in> me. <laughs> and, and we were laughing about it up there at one of the conventions. He'd come in, and he said, damn, boy, this boy like to beat the hell out of me over $40. <laughs> but he was a good guy. But, you know, I gave him long enough to pay it. I'm like a damn bad debt coming to, you know, time to pay up. But, you know, I really, I, I really, hey, I have no regrets. Anything I ever did. I mean, it's docile. He deserved what he got. If Vince told me to do it, I mean, it just, you know, it was an opportunity to do it. You know, you don't do anything unless you're told to do it. You don't go out to interview somebody, just walk out and start an interview with them. You don't do that. Madison Square Gardens, no. Anywhere, really, you know that. TV, whatever. If you're out interviewing somebody, and you know Memphis TV was live TV for years and years and yeah, years. Yeah, when it, when it was done, I it was done. Never, that's right. I never had a problem anywhere, anytime, because I always did what I was told to do. I didn't do anything outrageous or anything. You know, it was just, you know, I was told to do that. And then uh, he turns around, wants me to take the blame. And, you know, it's just a shame that he's got so much power that he can keep you out of the Hall of Fame. He can keep you out of the Cauliflower Alley Club. He can keep you out of all these uh, Hall of Fames, except Canadian Hall of Fame. I'm in there. But, you know, and he said, I would never get in one of his Hall of Fame just because I wouldn't lie for him. And I don't really care if I ever get in or not. I mean, you know, I'm not looking forward to ever getting in. I mean, I probably wouldn't take it anyway. It is awful. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, really, this guy, I mean, I, you know, I don't hate. I don't hate people. This guy is not people. This guy, my opinion of Vince McMahon, he's a piece of garbage or dog poop, like I told you. Garbage and dog poop is the same thing. He needs to be exterminated, done away with, because he is the sorriest piece of crap that I have ever met in my whole life. Through everything I've been through, this is the number one 
sawing piece of crap. In my opinion now, because you know you got to have it in your opinion. You can't make statements. Man. He'll I'll be suing say, you. Please, please let the record show that Cornette did not in, in any way advocate the extermination <laughs> of <laughs> right, right. I mean, on this week's <laughs> yeah. program, at least. It was, <laughs> it was to me that uh, complicated that whole thing. The field test is inconclusive to the fact that Cornette was part of it or not. You know, that's what they, that gets me on TV watching all this crap every day. I'm so fed up with this double talking crap on TV. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as as now that uh, Dr. D. David Schultz has accomplished the remarkable double of getting kicked off both television and podcasting, we will, David, Thank you. But I tell you what, hey, Jim, it's been a pleasure talking to you. And uh, let Brian say something every once in a while. I don't need to hear from him now. I've Thank you, Doctor. Enough, but... Thank you, Dr. D. <laughs> hey, David, thank you very much. Hey, thank uh, you. Everybody and, hey, I, look forward, I look forward to seeing you one day in person again. We can sit down and have a cup of coffee and hold hands under the table. Well, we we ain't that far away now because you're in Louis. I'm in Louisville and you're in Jackson. So we used to do that trip every week. Hey, you know you may not know it, but before I get off this phone, well, within ten minutes after I get off the phone, I'll have your home address, where you live, what you drive, and your bank account number. Well, I wouldn't wouldn't have done anyway, David. (laughs) All right, good talking to you, Brian. Thank you. And one more time, one more time, everybody buy the book on Amazon or at eatsleepwrestle.com. Don't call me fake by Dr. D. David Schultz and John Cosper. And and David, we got to get together every 38 years and do this again. We got to. Let me tell you, I'm waiting on the next 38. I just hope it don't go as fast as the last one. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't All right. You My time seems Thank to be you. going very slowly as I get older. Thank you very, David. We'll talk to All you right. later. Talk to you later, buddy. Bye-bye.